This is Corporate Warrior, high-intensity training lifestyle and business with Lawrence Neal, helping you improve your health and physique, become a great personal trainer, and start and grow your hit business. This episode is brought to you by ARX, the most innovative, efficient, and effective all-in-one exercise machines I have ever seen. I was really impressed with my ARX workout. The intensity and adaptive resistance was unlike anything I've ever experienced. I love how the machine enables you to increase the negative load to fatigue target muscles more quickly. And I love how the workouts are effortlessly quantified. The software tracks maximum force output, rate of work, total amount of work done and more in front of you on screen, allowing you to compete with your previous performance to give you and your clients real-time motivation. The ARX uses a computer-controlled motor to give you the exact amount of resistance your clients need 100% of the time. This means that the resistance can never become dangerous, is intuitive and simple to use, and can provide you with all of the results you and your clients are looking for in a fraction of the time. ARX is highly effective and efficient in delivering all of the benefits of exercise, including increased strength, muscle mass, cardiovascular conditioning, bone mineral density, and injury recovery. As well as being utilized by many high-intensity trainers to deliver highly effective and efficient workouts to their clients, ARX comes highly recommended by world-class trainers and brands, including Bulletproof, Tony Robbins, and Ben Greenfield Fitness. To find out more about ARX and get $500 off install when you place an order, please go to arxfit.com and mention Corporate Warrior and How Did You Hear About Us field. So again, to get $500 off install when you order, head on over to arxfit.com and enter Corporate Warrior and How Did You Hear About Us field. Lawrence Neal here. Welcome back to CorporateWarrior.co. My guest today is Dr. Ben Bokikio. And I always struggle to pronounce your name, Ben. So hopefully I did a good job there trying to pronounce it. Um, you fine. You're fine. <laughs> you are an innovator and leader in the fields of fitness, exercise and health since the 1970s. You founded Sports Conditioning in Staten Island and developed programs for weight reduction, cosmetic enhancement, general fitness and health and rehabilitation. You owned and supervised a number of private fitness and health centers from the early 1970s and developed and owned spine and cardiovascular rehabilitation centers where you used your Smart X program. Now at 70, uh, or maybe maybe you're a bit older than that now, Dr. Ben, I'm not sure. I keep getting older. I don't know how that happens. <laughs> yeah, no, because I just remember this bio might be a little uh, little dated. Um, but no, just, to, just to conclude no. it, uh, you continue to train regularly using revolutionary SmartX training system, which enables to maintain a high level of strength, significant muscle mass, and low body fat. And you continue to be much sought after expert consultant by corporate educational and individual clients. Ben, welcome to the show. Thank you, Neil. Uh, Lawrence, Mr. Neil, glad to be back. <laughs> <laughs> Don't don't worry. That's a, a common mistake. Um, I get called now all the time. What it's, uh, two first names. What's that? <laughs> that's what happens when you have two first names. That's the problem. That's the problem. And uh, it's quite uh, from what from what I've experienced, there uh, quite a lot of. Uh, I think I think Lawrence is quite. Uh, it would be unusual to have Lawrence as a first name in America. I don't. I mean, I'm not. I've not seen any Americans with Lawrence as a first name, especially with Neil as a last name. So maybe that's what also adds to the confusion. I don't know. What do you think? <laughs> yeah. Well, it, it's a possibility. I'm not that bright <laughs> to start with, so it's tricky. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. So. um so no, really pleased to have you back on the show. Um, you know, really enjoyed talking to you last time and have really enjoyed creating content with you for the membership as well. Um, you know, you you kind of emailed me out the blue with your thoughts about doing another show and talking about high intensity training and metabolic health and the science and business of all of that. Um, so I just, you know, just curious to know where you want to go with that. I mean, what's your thoughts on what have you been thinking about lately with regard to I guess the opportunities in science and business around, you know, high intensity training and metabolic health. Well, well, I think, um, you know, again, I've been in the field close to 50 years now uh, and, and I've seen it go and grow and, you know, offshoots happening and things. But, but I think now as a business um, with our most fertile population, you know, going to give us the biggest bang for our buck. I think metabolic health, 
And to describe that briefly, metabolic health means what, what's the condition of our, of our health regarding most of the issues that are a problem now, which are metabolic, meaning something's awry in our chemistry. So we're looking at obesity, diabetes, Alzheimer's, uh, these, these kind of things. Um, I think that's where exercise and the science of high intensity exercise, we're fortunate, very fortunate to be in this position because all really good science, or well, such a large percentage of the good scientific literature out there now and, and studies uh, indicate that high intensity exercise, as, as I describe it, and they sometimes describe it, um, is really the biggest bang for our buck as far as what we're going to get in benefits metabolically. In other words, what's going to change positively our, our fat storage, our uh, response to uh, healthy hormones, you know, insulin, keeping insulin in check, the relationship between glycolin, glycogen and insulin, in my opinion, is such a vital kind of a concept and, and uh, mechanism. Uh, so I think we're kind of lucky, and I honestly backed into this because it wasn't my initial thrust, you know, 46 years ago, but I quickly realized that, hell, this is a healthy thing to do, and I think as a business that trainers uh, should p portray themselves and be developed and have their own you know, background to understand this science and how to apply it, because I think those clients that are interested in health, and we all have our cosmetic and you know, uh, uh, kind of appeal that we want to, we want, we don't want to look old. We don't want to look out of shape. Okay. I got that. And it is a driving force. There's no question, but the people that recognize the depth of the value of metabolic health, you know, of anti-aging of not getting some of these degenerative diseases, or at least managing them if we are exposed to them, uh, I think really is a valuable tool that, um, Trainers, in my opinion, should be health coaches that specialize in exercise and obviously with a subspecialty in diet. And I think they've got to look at themselves professionally like that. And that will demand from their clients respect and dollars. Oh, yeah, completely agree. But what, what I'm interested in is what makes you think that because, you know, I talk to obviously people in the high intensity training industry all the time and it would seem to me that um, the majority are very aware of the kind of double whammy effect that hit plus a uh, healthy diet, you know, that might be a low carb or some kind of whole food approach um, has on uh, metabolism and on overall health. Now, what makes you feel, I get this feeling in what you're saying that you don't feel that it is that they are well aware of it or executing um, it's well in their business. What makes you think that? No, I, I I do think that. Yeah, I do. Right. I think it's it's a it should be an absolutely dominant objective and thought in the in the application of high intensity exercise. And and I I still think there's this little um you know high intensity exercise is you know red badge of courage. You know I, I kick ass and kick my own ass and I'm a tough this and I'm going to build huge muscle. I mean that's that's all cool and don't get me wrong. I, I I'm I'm with that. I got it. But that is not the basis and should not be one of the main objectives, I don't think, uh, at least philosophically, of your business as a trainer. Yeah. If, if this is a business in case we're trying to make a living and generate a, a high level of income or, or the highest we can from our situation, then I think that we have to go much more uh, predominantly to this metabolic health, feeling good, you know, and again, Think about the population, where it's going. Anti-aging, if you think about it, is really what we're about. We want to look young. We want to feel young. We want to, young, we want to function as younger people. Uh, and what does that mean? It means high level of muscle strength, endurance, um, you know, functional capacity, and anti-disease, anti-illness kind of protocols. Yeah. And is it, is it, is, is, okay. So if I understand this better, then it's almost like you're saying that, you know, we in high intensity training, um, we are in a, in a way in a bit of a bubble and we are a very niche industry still, unfortunately. Um, and, and there's this, there's this too much emphasis on the aesthetic on big muscles when, you know, there's, there's far more to this than just, I guess, the aesthetic, obviously. Um, I, I would say that, yeah. that there are, I mean, obviously, I guess it depends on your, your target market, right? But a lot of the high intensity training business owners I speak to, they are, um, they, they realize there's a lot of benefit in working with senior populations because, um, 
they know that they can deliver an enormous amount of value to them. And you've already listed that out in terms of the anti-aging benefits. Um, and they, they often can be quite affluent as well. So they, they generally can afford to pay for it in some cases. Um, and so that's been actually quite a, a common uh, target market for a lot of the high intensity training businesses out there. Um, but, but yeah, I guess there's still a lot of work to do uh, in terms of um, working with the rest of the fitness industry to, um, I guess, educate them better on what might be more effective for improving, you know, the health of the populace. Yeah, you see, Lawrence, but I mean, okay, they understand it, but I think that the oh, that's kind of kind of a baseline feeling or, or a thread that runs through this stuff from what I've seen is that this is more that this is really hard ass stuff, you know, um, right. and you're gonna you we're gonna put you through it, and okay, that's cool. But like, I, like I've told you many times, I believe, um, high-intensity exercise is not grueling, uh, overwhelmingly demanding, difficult, and painful. That's not what that's not, It may be all of those things or some of those things, but that's not what describes it. What describes high-intensity exercise and results in the benefits that we really want to accrue is the taxation of muscle fibers in a certain manner regarding uh, intensity, duration, style, and frequency. Okay, those are kind of your variables. And um, so understanding that that is what high intensity is all about. And then from there, you can apply it specifically to a client. But I'm saying as a general concept, and I'm not just talking about older people. I'm talking, there are people 35 years old that want to that want to stay young and fit. And I'm talking about, you know, pretty high level performance people that want that want these benefits. So it's not, but 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 we, but I don't, like the fact that we really go over what's the, for example, you know, when, when is the best time to, to have a protein supplement or shake? How many minutes after my training session? You know, basically between you, me and the lamppost for 99% of the people, of course shit. Okay. I mean, of course. That, that, you know, it doesn't mean it. Get, get, get your macros, you know, understand if you, and you want to get into this a little deeper, that's great, but come on, give me a break. I mean, you know, nobody's going to tell me because, you get a, a 3% spike in some kind of a, a positive anabolic response higher than somebody who doesn't do this thing for a week, uh, a week's um, training you know, a- analyzation as a study that this is, this is really relevant in the, in the, in the myriad of things to think about, it should be way down the list. That, that's kind of my point. You, you get it. And, and the purity, for example, you know, some of these machine people, and I was one of them, tr- trust me, I was a, one of the original, believe me, one of the original Nautilus guys involved in a lot of stuff that went on with Nautilus. Um, I, I realized after the fact that these machines are tools, you know, and they're a means to an end and that you can achieve those ends with a lot of stuff that I didn't think you could uh, just as well. And so, you know, when we're talking about the perfect exercise and perfect machines and, you know, uh, you know, we're starting to get into the minutia, uh, you know, uh, and yeah. we can't see the forest for the trees, you know, so... That, that's what I'm talking about, okay? And I, I'm all for the guys who want to get as big and strong and buff as they can. Listen, I mean, I've always been lucky enough to be a pretty muscular guy, okay? And I got it, and I'm proud of it and all that stuff. I got that, okay? But that, to me, is is a bell and whistle. You know, it's a high-level computer system and a backup camera in a car. You know, it's not the engine. It's not the, the things, that the, the nuts and the bolts of the process. I like that analogy. <laughs> that's good. Uh, yeah. yeah, no, I, I completely agree. Um, and, and I think, yeah, I, I can hear, hear what you're saying. It's, um, maybe the, 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 sh- there needs to be more of a focus on the benefits that this will ha- have on our health and realizing that you don't need to, um, you know, have the perfect high intensity training protocol. Um, you know, uh, I did a podcast recently with Luke and, you know, he was talking about, um, the environment that I think Ken Hutchins, um, uh, kind of came up with in terms of the optimal environment for training in terms of the fans and the mm-hmm. appropriate temperature. And uh, it's Luke's opinion that, um, that there's no evidence to support that that will produce better results. And uh, that doesn't mean it's not, uh, that people can't use it. I mean, you know, if you, if you want to use that type of, um, uh, environment and it p- creates a better atmosphere for yeah. you and your clients, and that's absolutely fine. But yes, I, I, you know, obsessing to the, to the, and splitting hairs over all of these things 
you're right, it's perhaps not that right. important for the, the most people that come through the door. Um, but there are people like maybe you and I and maybe a lot of our colleagues in high intensity training who, who enjoy splitting hairs because we are a little bit obsessive. I mean, we, we spent the last podcast together splitting hairs the whole entire time about training protocols and pre-exhaust and all this sort right. of thing. Um, but but yeah, it's understanding where that where the, that's um, appropriate and where it's not appropriate. So have I got that right? Is that kind of where you're coming from? Yeah, you know, I don't know if you know Ivor Cummins. I mean, he's a yes. great speaker on. He's been on the podcast. Uh, all right. Well, Ivor was it? Okay. Oh, right, he's yeah. Okay. So he he he's a uh, uh, engineer, and he refers to a Pareto principle in engineering, and basically the principle says. 80% of what you'll achieve is uh, fostered by 20% of your activity. In other words, if you're looking at things to do, 20% of the stuff that we think about provides 80% of the benefit. So let's go there first, and then we can get picky and, and, and detail. Okay, that's, that's kind of my point. Um, but I also think uh, from the science part of this thing, I think that, Lawrence, that the trainer should have to spend some time and effort in learning the science. Now I'm I'm developing, and they let me with with this. It's a, a organization, National Association of Sports Nutritionists (NASN), and I like the people involved. And they asked me if I would write the uh, resistance exercise curriculum for their trainers, okay, for the the training certification. And I said, yeah, if you give me leeway, and you don't, you know, you, and I, I tell you what, I looked at some of the protocols and some of the educational material, and a lot of it is non-relevant. I think it's just Again, I think it's bullshit. You, I don't use it. There were some questions on some of these tests, Lawrence, and I'll tell you the truth. I had a wing to, to guess to what the hell they were asking me, and I think I have a pretty good grip on what the heck's going on, okay? Uh, and I said, well, wh wh what does somebody have to know this stuff? How is this applicable? How does it make them a better trainer and a better dispenser of information for their clients, you know? And so I, I kind of pared this thing down to what I thought was practical, and I'll, I'll send you a copy, if you like, of what I've written yeah, so far. And I think this is these are things that I think you should know, okay? And some of these other things become so officious, and they're trying to, you know, replicate the certifications for doctors in certain subspecialties, and it's just obviously there's no tangible, there's, there's no practical uh, clinical experience that these people have exposed. They're just totally theoretical, and to me, this turns people off, and it, and it gives the trainer much more crap to have to deal with than the stuff that I think will be vital and applicable and beneficial for a, a, a private practice. I'm trying to develop a certification with these people for, for folks who want to do private practice as opposed to folks who want to work in a box gym or get those kind of jobs. I want somebody to listen. You can develop your own practice, okay, in 150 square feet of space and, and make a good living from it, And but be your own man. Be the, be the authority. Have your connections. I got that. But be the authority, be a reliable source of good information. And I think that's why I think the science is important, the basic science, the applicable science. And that's why I think this business really is going to go in the future, because I think you're going to get educated people, like you say, have a little more uh, financial status that will stay with you a longer period of time and appreciate the subtleties of the knowledge that you present as opposed to the general blueprint of we're just going to work hard and kick your ass and we'll all be ass kickers together. You know I mean? I, I don't get that. Yeah. You know, I don't see it. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And I think uh, I speak for a lot of people when I say just how grateful we are that you are getting involved at that level uh, and, you know, changing you know, changing things and changing the way some of these institutions train their trainers. And I think that's wonderful. Um, and I'm just really pleased to hear that you're doing really great work. You know, you're in, in a lot, you know, at your, your age, a lot of people would be uh, sitting back, but you're getting, you're very busy. You know, I was on YouTube earlier today watching some of your low carb USA presentations, <laughs> which I was enjoying. Um, so yeah. what, what, tell me, what, what are you up to generally? So you, you mentioned, obviously, your, that sounds like a big project, to be fair. Um, but what else, are you, what else have you been busy doing? Well, I, I'm actually, you know, I, I got involved with Low Carb USA because I like where they're going. I mean, I, I like the fact that they're what they're trying to do, one of the main things they're trying to do is to change what they call the standard of care. And let me explain that for a second. When a doctor treats you for a certain condition, there are certain acceptable and these are 
verbal. These are not written laws or tenants or anything else, acceptable practices. In other words, if it's been acceptable for diabetes and standard of care to, you know, put you on metformin and then eventually on insulin and, you know, tell you to eat fewer calories. Okay. But what's not standard of care yet, in other words, if I'm a doctor and I say to you, you know, we can reverse this thing by reducing carbohydrates significantly and by doing some exercise that's going to be a glycogen um, drawer, like high intensity exercise, for example, um, that is not particularly the standard of care. So as a, as a physician, when I tell you this, and I don't tell you, for example, to go on a statin, and I don't tell you to take metformin, or I don't tell you to inject insulin, and something happens to that patient, some, some lawyer could come by and say, listen, you aren't acting within the standard of care. Uh, and so now you've got some exposure, you know, which to me is it's, it's, it's so silly. So what we're doing with this low carb organization, low carb USA, is there are trials going on now. There is reversal of diabetes in randomized controlled studies uh, using these protocols. But now you have to get out and educate the doctors right. and the practitioners <laughs> that, that this is at least an exceptional and acceptable option. So now it becomes part of the standard of care. So you're, so now you're not irresponsible for grabbing these things. You're at least reasonable and you have a basis for doing it. That's, that's the kind of that thing. Takes and I think even the forever, standard, forever, doesn't it? Yeah, well, it takes, yeah, yeah, no, it, it takes um, a lot of PR. It takes a lot of people working on the science, which we're doing. Uh, Finney and Volick and, and, and Finney, uh, Dr. Steve Finney, in his Verta company, V I R T A, is reversing diabetes through that protocol in randomized controlled studies. And he's got the data. He's got the data. Now we've got some real science. So now we've got to get up there and expose this science and this information to doctors so they feel comfortable and the powers that be accept this as at least a reasonable alternative standard of care. Okay. So a little bit we can apply this to um, training. Okay. Is this acceptable? You, you know, uh, this type of training that we do, the, in my case, you know, slow training, high intensity training. I mean, it's, it has become really accepted because there's a lot of literature on it. But at some point, when I first started to do high intensity training, Lawrence, with cardiac patients, the, the doctors were scared to death that they were okay. going to be sued. Then all this is going to get a heart attack. We can't do this. I said, there's enough science behind. It. And now, now it's standard of care. Okay. It's become that. Uh, and so that, that's, you know, a little bit what we know is say, let's get to some real science. Let's be open-minded enough to say there is another way to go, but but our way seems to be working. And if you look at the historical trajectory of what, how we're treating some of these diseases, we ain't doing very good, okay? <laughs> we're not treating obesity and diabetes and Alzheimer's very well, are we? I mean, it, it seems like there might be a better way because this sure as hell isn't it. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, so let, let's get to knowledge, okay? And again, if you apply this to training, the business, the science and the business of metabolic health is where really everybody wants to go because, and not to push my book, but you know, I have a five week metabolic makeover. So it's a cutesy name. But all I'm saying is anybody who's trying to exercise and diet is really trying to change their metabolism. Bottom line, what are you trying to do? You're trying to change your chemistry from a, a sugar burner to a fat burner, from a, a fat person to a lean person, from a person that might not be totally healthy to a healthy person. How does that occur? That occurs by instigating changes and signals in your metabolism. What are the two best ways to do that? What are the most powerful behaviors? Diet and exercise. What kind of diet? Probably restricted carb or controlled carb and probably high intensity exercise. And now be able to explain why these things and what the mechanisms are and what the pathways are that we're trying to do. And I think that's a good business model and a good plan. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's interesting. I was educated recently by um, Dr. Ted Dreisinger, who's a expert in chronic low back pain, um, and who I met at the okay. the resistance exercise conference last year, and I've had on the podcast numerous times. And he was educating me on um, why this stuff, you know, to your point, why it takes so long to update standard of care um, in so many different domains um, because and he was explaining to me how there's so many people currently um, eating from the trough, you know, with regards to people depending uh -huh. on salaries and, uh, and, and so you would almost have to restructure and undo a lot of that uh, in, in some cases. And we were specifically, we were talking about the number of 
um, protocols available or services available for um, lower back therapy, which may be in, in a lot of cases completely redundant um, because you know, and I, I won't go into too much detail, but he was, and I'm sure you're all familiar with this stuff, Ben, but he, he was basically saying that, in a, you know, back yeah. pain in more often than not cures itself. And we don't know why in, in short. Um, and, and, but, but there's tons of evidence out there to show that, you know, lower back strength training is a very, very powerful intervention. Um, and, and, and I, you know, I kind of followed up and said, well, why is it not standard of care then? And he explained to me, well, you know, there's so many people obviously relying on the existing system that you would have to, undo all of that so even though the science is there it takes you know he was saying decades for it to actually you know come to fruition in the real world um and change the the way we do things and do you think that's how i mean how long do you think it's going to be for instance till we start um you know until we change the standard of care in the context you're talking about in terms of um you know therapeutic interventions regarding diet and training um you know rather than putting people on or by default, putting people on statins and things like that. How yeah, long well, is that going to take? A couple, a couple, let, me, let me address a couple of those questions. You know, good old Dr. Ben has done a few things in this 50 years. So when you're talking about <laughs> low back treatment, um, you, you know the MedEx company was founded on a, the initial was the low back testing, okay, and training device, right? The lumbar yeah. MedEx. Great machine. Okay. Now, doc, good old Dr. Ben here was the exercise physiologist and an owner of part of a company that did the back, what we called back typing for MedEx. What we did is we measured the, the uh, training effect and recovery effect of this protocols on the MedEx lumbar machine and how we had different outliers. Some people could respond really quickly and recover quickly. Some it took two or three days. Okay, that we called it back typing. This was with Dr. David Lehrman, who was the president of the um, uh, National Low Back Physicians society or some such thing. Anyway, I was the exercise physiologist in that and, you know, worked with the author. Uh, and a lot of people don't know that I owned a company that actually was the company that did testing for MedEx. So I know a little bit. I, and I owned the low back center with Dr. Lehrman in uh, Miami beach and we had MedEx stuff anyway. Uh, so yeah, but, but you see what's really good about this to be alive this time in, in history is that information now can just get out there like crazy. So now there's not a this lag time. I mean, what, say with the metabolic movement now, there's a lot of stuff going on, and a lot of people jumping on the bandwagon, and a lot of people that are taking uh, a, a kind of a financial leap of faith that have successful practices that are saying, "I think we're changing this protocol, and I here are the benefits we're getting clinically." So this thing is kind of snowballing. So if you ask me how long it's taking, I think now, if and you've, we've had some big cases, Doctor Noakes. Uh, I think it's fat key. There's a bunch of yeah. guys that have had their licenses and stuff, but they've won in court. I've got a good buddy, a new good buddy in, in uh, Phoenix here, uh, who has had his license taken away as a cardiac surgeon because he refused to put people on statins that didn't need it. And he told people to watch their diet and stay away from, and don't, and not to worry about cholesterol. Has license taken away at 73 years old. Okay. But, but he's, isn't, isn't he's dietary... going out and speaking about. I thought there was a sorry, mm -hmm. sorry to interrupt you, but I thought there was. Um, uh, yeah. I thought the I don't know if you call it the standard of care or the recommended guidelines or whatever it is, but I thought that um, there wasn't a limit now on dietary cholesterol in America, or is that still is that not the case? I thought that was that was now kind of well, no, no, accepted. But, 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 well, wasn't a limit? No, I'm I'm not aware of that, uh, mm. Lawrence. I I know that um, because you know still it is standard if somebody's if somebody's LDL, which is a ridiculous number it, it's like what colors your lipstick i mean it has nothing right. to do with your you know little in and of itself as a singular element that it's preposterous um but there's still standard of care is if somebody's ldl is under is over a hundred okay then you can put them on statins everything's cool you, you don't have any exposure and there are studies that show that if you get your ldls under 100 that it probably has some damaging negative effects okay so no um, my, my own, my point is first step is at least have these protocols accepted as an alternative that is not irresponsible because there's, there is clinical evidence now. And there's certainly a lot of theoretical evidence that this stuff works and it arrives us, arrives us at a place where we want to be in the treatment. And maybe it has, you know, as we're zealous of this kind of protocol 
has way more benefits and much less of a downside than this, the other standard possibility, standard of care possibility. Okay, there's where you go. At least for at first, make it acceptable, and then as a doctor, you know, if you want to apply this and you're starting to get good results, I think a responsible physician is going to say, hey, why not go this way? Okay, but at least have it as part of an acceptable myriad of practices. Okay. That's where you go. And I think the same thing would be with low back. I mean, I think you're going to see with a lot of the stuff that's been out there that there's enough and you have to put this together. You have to structure this. This is organizational. Okay. You have to structure the, the data and say, these, this is the data we're showing from these studies. And this should at least be a consideration as to a protocol that would be considered the standard of care. And that as a result of that, we can eliminate some of these other things which are driving, theoretically driving to get to these same places, but we think we have a, a more uh, effective, safer, and a, a more reliable way to get to those desired uh, levels of you know, back function. This episode is brought to you by our sponsor, ARX. Are you looking to create a cutting edge, high intensity training facility? Are you confused on what equipment to use or how to separate yourself from the masses? Well, then ARX Fit might be the answer you're looking for. I asked Mike Palano from ARX a few questions about how ARX machines are challenging the status quo of the exercise industry around the globe. Mike, if you could, give the listeners a quick summary of why ARX is so different from the traditional machines or tools they're used to seeing in most exercise facilities. ARX is totally different than anything you've seen before. This isn't just another weight stack machine. We've looked at the last 40 years of exercise technology and used that knowledge to create something entirely new. ARX uses a new form of resistance, a motor, and we pair that motor with computer software so that we can maximize the safety, effectiveness, and efficiency of your workouts. So you may be asking, okay, but how does ARX compare to weights? Traditional machines you see in gyms today are based on lifting metal weights and battling gravity. What people don't realize is that when you're forced to lift a static weight like this, one that doesn't adapt or change while you use it, you're underloading yourself rep after rep. And this unnecessarily limits your ability to make improvements. With ARX, we've taken a totally different approach. We removed weights and gravity from the equation altogether. Instead, ARX combines our patented motorized resistance with our custom computer software to provide you with the world's safest, most effective, and most quantified form of resistance training ever. When you train with ARX, you are training to your perfect level of resistance, both positively and negatively 100% of the time. No more guessing what weight to use, ARX does all of that for you, instantly and automatically. We'll also track and measure every second of every rep, so you can quantify all of your workouts to find out if you're improving and by exactly how much. Whether your goals are bigger muscles, increased strength, stronger bones, or just to look good in a bathing suit, ARX can help you achieve all of these and more, but do so in a fraction of the time it would take compared to traditional equipment. If you're looking for the most efficient, most effective, and most quantified piece of exercise equipment on the market today, then look no further than ARX. Thanks, Mike. That all sounds really impressive. If you'd like to learn more about ARX, visit arxfit.com and mention that you heard about ARX on the Corporate Warrior podcast to receive an exclusive deal of $500 off shipping and installation off your ARX machines. Yeah. Um, Are you familiar with Dr. James Steele, Ben? Who? Dr. James Steele. Yeah, uh, James Steele, PhD. He's... Uh, responsible for oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah offering a number of um, papers on resistance training and exercise yeah. and chronic low back pain and stuff, uh, operates out of the UK. Um, you might be interested to hear that he's actually recently um, been assigned a role with uh, UK Active, uh, and he's actually playing a role in um, revising the exercise guidelines in the UK. Um, and at the moment, there is a you know wow. there is there is uh, some resistance training. Um, you know, uh, recommended, but it's 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 not. Um, it's, it certainly doesn't form the the most important part of the exercise recommendation. So, uh, James, and it's great that James is involved in this because um, you know James is a very uh, very good scientist. And, what's that? 
Yeah, you should hook me up with this guy. You, you should hook me yeah. up with this guy. I do know the name. Maybe I know the name through you. I'm not sure, but Post I do know the name. Right. So here's, yeah. here's, an, here's an interesting read on, specifically about what we're talking about. Yes, resistance training now has become more and more prominent in the list of accepted practice. However, the philosophy, the theoretical basis is that muscle work, you know, resistance exercise it provides these mechanical benefits of strengthening and more better balance and bone health. We still haven't gotten into the fine tuning and the understanding of the metabolic power of the muscle system. That's exactly what I'm talking about when I talk about metabolic health. Yeah, so, let's talk about yeah, it. I want, I, want to, I want to learn more about that. But you haven't accepted that. Well, okay. do you know what? Like, that, 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 yeah. Sorry, you go. <laughs> okay. So my point is that, it, yeah, okay, we understand. Yeah, it's good. It's good. But when you're talking about metabolic function, chemical changes in your body, okay, it has not been appreciated, certainly, to the by any means to the extent that it is actually uh, contributory to this. Maybe, I mean, the, the muscle system is basically an endocrine system. I mean, not to get too crazy with science, oh, but you have too. responses from... Okay, all right. So you have what we call anacrine, paracrine, and endocrine responses. Anacrine means that the muscle, whatever the, the tissue is that's working, or the cells that are working, um, pass this benefit on to the same kinds of cells, okay? And that's anacrine. Par paracrine means that they pass the same effect on and send these signals to similar cells. Endocrine means you send it globally through the whole body, the, the signal, okay? It, it can be certainly accepted that muscles can do all three of those things. Now, if you remember in my book, I write about, and I've not seen this written again anywhere, I write about local and global benefits of exercise. That's exactly what I'm talking about. So good stuff happens at the site of the working muscles, and more predominantly some of this stuff happens in that in that particular muscle group exercise, but yet the global systems, the cardiorespiratory, cardiovascular, nervous system, humoral, you know, um, hormone system, respond, and you get a global response. So I think that understanding that the local and global effects of exercise, understanding a little bit of that science, is very beneficial. When I tell that to people and clients and other physicians, okay, they say, "Wow, that's really un interesting." That's why, Lawrence, we do for metabolic health the whole body in one workout. That's why we try to, you know, kind of a little bit isolate muscles to get the biggest bang locally and also understanding that and we do it, if we do it in a certain sequence, we get this global response. So we're getting both of these benefits, local and global, and then we're recovering. That there's where I have a, and then then we're ready to do it again. That there's where I have a difference say with McGuff, although I think he's a little less adamant about one time a week, but th th there's no indication that one time a week is sufficient or at least optimal for metabolic health doing high intensity exercise. I, I don't see any indication for that. Um, you know, th there's too many variables that come to fruition and are ready to go again within 48 hours and certainly within 60. So that's the twice a week he, thing. I keep coming back to it. Yeah, no, I, I get that. Yeah. And, um, but what, what I think, you know, when Doug talks about once a week, um, you know, I think sometimes it gets taken out of context. And, you know, I've heard Doug say, you know, um, we're probably, obviously, like, I think, I think, what is it? Uh, 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 Wayne Westcott's study um, showed that, I think, you know, muscle repairs after w whatever is 72 hours uh, in most cases. But yeah. I think what he's trying to also factor in is responsibilities and stresses. Um, and, and in his particular context, he's on a rotating schedule because he's an ER uh, physician. Um, and I think he, he almost just said, look, once a week is sufficient, um, you know, based on all of those factors. Um, because, I may, well, maybe he's, I don't know, maybe he's concerned that some people may overtrain with twice a week. I don't know. But uh, I just got the feeling you know, that it, it, that's more like every five days. Yeah, but I, he just said once a week for simplicity. You know what I mean? Yeah, well, I'd say twice a week for simplicity and for efficiency. <laughs> because, Fair I, enough. well, I, here's the problem. I mean, if 100 milligrams is the prescribed dosage, and you're taking 50, are you going to get some benefit? Yeah. Is that the optimal? No. That's why you do hundreds of million dollars worth of stu a study to see what the optimal dosage is. And I disagree on the optimal dosage for a myriad of responses that we're trying to elicit. If we're talking about, even if we're talking about simple muscle growth, I, I don't agree. I haven't seen it. Okay. Uh, and I'm sure you can pick, 
pick and choose some certain studies and you can pick and choose certain um, signaling proteins maybe that need a, a certain length of time. But if you put all this together and put it into a big soup, you come out with, you know, two servings a week. <laughs> I think that that to me is optimal. Are there outliers? Absolutely. Always. Sure. Lawrence, you know that. Mm. They're always outliers. And mm. and can you maintain a reasonable level once a week? I think, yes, you can. Do I think it's optimal? No, I don't. Yeah. That, that's, that's where I stand. Okay. And I've, I've heard, uh, you know, yeah. I've, um, there's a number of experts that um, agree with you on the twice a week being better for, um, you know, metabolic health and perhaps cardiovascular fitness. Um, so like, yeah, no, I, I, I see where you're coming from. Absolutely. Um, yeah. But the, the, the concept around global metabolic health, you know, you mentioned you hadn't seen that before, but you know, you've read Body by Science. You must have seen Doug's. Talk. I mean, Doug is in in here. From what I, I understood, Doug was well known for for coming up with that concept. No, um, I'm not. Global, he he described aerobic as as being um, aerobic conditioning or aerobic pathways, beneficial pathways, as being uh, a, a result of high intensity training. Yeah, no, but I, I separated. I, specifically, there are global and there are local effects right. of exercise and benefit. Now, the the fact that you locally can produce global effects, obviously, I mean, it, it's kind of obvious. But he made he made a good point of saying, I think, in his stuff that that aerobic. There's a whole new way to look at aerobic benefits or cardio. I think cardiovascular and these terms become mushed up and and, and less than specific. But um, I, I think his thing was, and I certainly agree that you can um, benefit the aerobic system and aerobic pathways by well, like what we call anaerobic means, okay? Because I, I, I tell you, that, uh, uh, my second, what was that? Was that my doctor? I can't remember. Uh, or a study, or I did a study, and I said, instigating um, anaerobic and aerobic benefits of exercise in one protocol. In other words, you can do them both in one, and I, I – presented that study 13 years ago, American College of Sports Medicine. So you can do those things. I mean, I presented that yeah, 13, 14 years ago. Uh, but but as far as the local and global designation, I've not seen it written like that. I mean, if somebody does, that's great. God bless them. I mean, some people think I claim all this stuff. But I, I didn't see it before. And, you know, I, I mean, it's like Columbus. He didn't know about, you know, the, the Vikings landing in North America, and, and nobody else did. So for all intents and purposes, he was the first guy to go there because nobody else remembered this or even knew it except like 15 people in Iceland, <laughs> you know. So, so I, I know, but that's my point. My, you know, when some people say to me, um, well, you know, you didn't create low, slow resistance training. I said, well, here's the, here's the reality. Arthur Jones, um, Ellington Darden, Jimmy Flanagan, myself, uh, Ken Hutchins, none of us knew about slow training before good old Dr. Ben described it and was using it and they came and learned it. Okay. So if it existed before and, you know, just the fact that somebody says go slow in your, in your weight training movements, like somebody like Bob Hoffman, who I kind of denigrated because I knew Bob Hoffman. I don't think he created anything to be honest with you. Uh, I wasn't a bad man or anything. Didn't treat me poorly, but I just don't think he had a creative mind. I mean, I'll be honest with you. He was, he was a good salesman and marketer. Okay. But the point was I, none of us knew about this. And there was certainly no system of flow training available, a system, okay, with a basis available before I brought it to the forefront in 1973, 74. Okay, that's all I'm trying to say. So when people mm -hmm. say, well, gee, you know, you're not the guy. It's, okay, I'm not the guy, except everybody else who knows anything about this knows that I'm the guy. Because why is that? Why I is that so important? To them. I mean, forgive me if this sounds like a weird question, Ben, but why is that so important to you? I mean, surely you're just happy that people are. That's important. It's important. Influenced. It's important because recidivist history is almost never accurate. In other words, they say, what the, it's basically saying to me, what the hell do you know about it? It was there before, and these are the guys. I said, well, no, honestly, it wasn't. Right. It thought, Listen, I've made more money than any of these guys, and so it's not like they're taking any, you know, I was, I asked, I had lawyers ask me, do you want to sue these guys? I said, well, sue for what? What I'm going to take? Their shoes? They don't own anything. They don't have anything. It's not that. But I mean, at least a little bit of, uh, uh, the acknowledgement that yeah, mm -hmm. this is where this is where it started. I don't. It doesn't make me a better man or a clever man or a genius or any other damn thing. But it's like, come on, fellas, this is where it started. So if you want to ask people about it, maybe get the information from the horse's mouth instead of the other end. That's all I'm saying. Yeah, fair enough. And um, I wanted to. Yeah, I wanted I wanted to, to ask, ask Lawrence. It made, 
It may be that I'm just an old grumpy guy. That's a possibility too. I got it. I'll accept that. <laughs> I wasn't going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I wanted to, I, I'm not sure if we got onto this last time I spoke to you because it feels like I spoke to you ages ago. Um, but I'm just, you know, I was watching yep. you, I was watching you on, um, on YouTube earlier today and I was like, you know, you just, you look well, you, uh, you move well, you just don't seem your age. I mean, it's quite inspiring. It re- it's really inspiring actually. Um, so just curious, I mean, I know I can, I can kind of guess what your diet and training looks like based on your book, um, which I'll obviously link to in the show notes, 15 minutes of fitness. Um, but I just love to hear like, how does your, what does your diet currently look like now? How, what does your training look like at the moment? I do two high intensity workouts a week and now i've kind of a little fiddled with it a little bit in fact i spoke to kenny hutchins which i hadn't done in years but he put a little spark in my head about they're doing some of these uh isometric or whatever they call them static super status on horseshit but anyway okay so and i always thought that was kind of interesting so anyway but what i'm doing now is because i've got a lot of joint problems okay um i do twice a week training one day i go really heavy okay where i'm probably 40 to 60 seconds load time. And then maybe I try to do uh, a static hold or an isometric on the negative that I, where I, where I haven't completed a positive, you know, maybe midpoint or something. And I do seven or eight exercises, extension, leg extensions, leg curls, rowing, uh, shoulder laterals, pec flies, uh, curls, rope push down, uh, basically, you know, then I'll maybe do some rehab stuff for my, I rotate a cuff and a wrist, but you know, my basic workout of those, of those exercises. Okay. Uh, and can you add one subtract? Yeah, I got, that's not a problem, but that's what I do twice a week, uh, Wednesdays and Sundays. Okay. Uh, can then I, can I, I ask, do you, do you, um, so, sorry to interject Ben, but do you, um, when you compare your current strength to how you were in your prime, if you want to call it that, you know, maybe, I don't know, yeah. Well, maybe you're in your prime now. Who knows? But uh, I'm just curious, has your no, strength not, changed no, much? <laughs> <laughs> um, the, 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 the major determinant of my pure strength has been joint problems. In other words, rotate a cuff, so that that is not as strong. Um, six knee surgeries, but uh, to be honest with you, for example, the leg extensions, I mean, I'm still on a Nautilus machine, you know, up pretty much on a stack or very close to it with slow reps, okay? So it seems that my quads have maintained pretty on tricep stuff, pretty much as strong as, you know, uh, and, and maybe not to the, maybe, maybe I'm at 85, 90% of my max, max. Okay. But wow. really haven't seen much of a degeneration. So mostly it's mechanical strength. What, what I have found is my muscular endurance has diminished. In other words, where I could do a hard cardio at 15 Mets for 35 to 45 minutes. Okay. I can barely do now. I'm busting my ass as sincerely as I can 10 or 12 minutes. I mean, probably closer to 10, honestly. And that is fascinating to me. Well, I'm just curious as to what, and I've talked to, I talked to Volek. I talked to Finney because they do some endurance uh, athletes uh, stuff and nobody's really come up with what's going on. Um, and so I don't know, it may be hormonal. I, I got it. I, I, but that, that, that I've seen diminish a little bit. Um, and so that's, that's, you know, that's basically it. And, and I'm, I'm have to make sure I do stretch because I do have some limitations in my neck and back and shoulders. But, um, yeah, but I see I've maintained a really high level of muscle size. Okay. You know, my weight's down from my max weight. I'm probably down 15 pounds of muscle, but that was because I was really, really going at it and eating it. And I might've been even a little heavier. I was heavier, 15 pounds heavier or so than I am now, but still, you know, and, and I've shrunk, you know, as far as actual height, but my bone height is still a little over five foot ten. So, um, and I'm still close to two hundred pounds, pretty lean, you know, single digits. So that, that's that's decent, you know. Mm-hmm. And what about your diet? Oh, uh, I'm pretty low carb. I eat a lot of meat. I, I'm a, you know, uh, I, I you're who, carnivore. Ted, I heard Ted Nathan. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm, I'm not. Totally kind of work. You know, I'm Italian. I like vegetables, you know. Um, <laughs> one second here. But I, I do I have big salad. Like, I love cob salads with, you know, bacon and chicken and turkey and cheese and eggs. And But I eat huge salads and I eat um, some vegetables. But I eat a lot of meat. I eat a lot of beef. 
Um, I like fatty pork. I like ribs and some pork chops. Um, I do eat fish once in a while. Uh, but that's, that's basically, you know, that's, and if I have, you know, chicharinos, you know, pork rinds for, uh, snacks or something, but it's mostly that. And I, uh, I'm pretty good with it. And I, I love that kind of food. So it's not a big problem for me, but I do eat that. And I eat, uh, and I have almost always, this is very interesting. I almost never in my life ate before two o'clock in the day. So I always intermittently fasted, you know, unknowingly. Uh, I was just never hungry in the morning. And it may just be because I'm a good fat burner and I didn't, I, I could use those reserves and didn't have that sugar fluctuation. You know, I didn't rely on the sugar that much. So I, and, and so I do that. If I'm, if I'm up three or four pounds, I'll try to eat once a day, which is the, you know, the unscientific way to, you know, intermittently fast. In the old days, we called it eating once a day. <laughs> but, I you know, and I do think that, I, I think there's an insulin spiking, insulin, not spiking, but an insulin a stimulating concept when you eat. I think not eating when you're not eating insulin is low when you're eating insulin is high when you're not eating fat is being burned when you're eating fat is being stored I mean that's a generalization but I, I think there's something to that I mean yeah so I think that the time the time of eating uh, and I think the macronutrient that, that works for me but by the same token I have seen a bunch of other stuff work for other people so I think that may be more individual but for the general public it's a really good way to start because again Pareto principle, I think 80% of the people benefit very highly from that kind of adaptation in diet. Yeah, for sure. Um, so I, I could say, so you'll do what, one meal a day usually or, or two meals a day? Or is that typical for you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, I would say average one and a half meals a day. So this reminds me of a cute little description, uh, Lawrence. You know, if you, if you look at averages, they're not always representative because the average human being has one testicle and one breast. But that doesn't work out that well. <laughs> yeah, that's good. <laughs> um, so, so I, so I know because it's similar to me because I do, uh, I do two meals, uh, generally two meals a day. Um, I will generally bring, I generally bring it closer. So I, I, I've started, and I had a conversation with someone recently about this. Um, and I'll, I'll have my first meal maybe around 12 and then I'll have my second meal maybe around 4 or 5 p.m. But I've tried to bring it closer as opposed okay. to having that second meal later because um, there's some some people think that it's uh, it can really affect your sleep quality if you eat you know too much too late in the day. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm just sort of playing around with that at the moment. Have you got any thoughts on that? No, I, I think I think that's really individual. I, okay. Lawrence, I could eat a pound and a half ribeye at eight o'clock at night and I'll be asleep by nine thirty like an old bear, you know? So it, it, it's specific, but I have heard of that, <laughs> of that kind of thing. I don't have a problem sleeping, but I think sleeping is really important. So if it, it, listen, if it affects you that way, you have to keep track of it. You have to be organized and then maybe fiddle with it. Uh, and I don't know that there's enough science at all to say what that window of eating should be. If it's two hours, four hours, six hours, eight, I, I think that's way up in the air, and I think it's very individual at this point. Um, okay. But I don't think, you know, going towards a, a shorter frame of, of eating time and a longer time, time of fasting, unless if that's comfortable for you. You know, we're not, we're not trying to have cravings happen and make us crazy on the other end of this thing, gorging. But, uh, yeah, I mean, you got to play with that. That, I think, is individual. But the general tendency and that, that general trajectory pattern of eating, I think, is – there's some benefit to it. I, I think I, I see that people. Right, yeah. And that's the thing, isn't it? When you um when you repair your metabolism and you eat a healthy diet, um like the diet you just described, which is very similar to my own, you just don't get cravings between meals. You just don't get the need to snack. Um, especially not if you're sleeping right as well. I mean, obviously if you get that wrong, then that can really derail things. Um but yeah, I just noticed there is no there is no for me, I mean, I do two two pretty large meals uh, and I have no really no challenge with that at all so yeah but yeah. for what you describe as your metabolism you need to eat okay you're, you're you're somebody who needs to make sure you're getting your nourishment getting your protein uh you know because that's you know but i and i think most people do and as far as cravings you know then we start to get into you know behavioral stuff with eating and eating my, my second uh, doctor was on the effect of exercise on long-term weight loss maintenance, but my review of literature was the development of obesity uh, and fat-related disorders, and I broke down obesity and fat-related disorders, 
into five categories, mechanical, metabolic, neurological, um, behavioral, and some other damn thing. Anyway, a nutritional. And so this is a very complex, eating in itself is a very complex uh, situation. And right. there's a lot of stuff that goes into that behavioral and, and psychological and social and environmental. And then you've got, you know, real hunger and need. And then, then there's the energy part, which we try to break it down, simplify it. It ain't that simple, you know. Oh, interesting. Well, we maybe have to uh, shelve that one for another conversation. Um, but look, Ben, this has been this has been uh, a lot of fun as always. What's the best way for people to find out more about you? Um, Doctor Benbo at hotmail dot com. D R B E N B O at hotmail dot com. Mm-hmm. Um, they can go. I think Doctor Benbo. Uh, Doctor Benbo dot com. And they can see some stuff on there. I have the book, 15 Minutes of Fitness, and I have all my information. You can just Google me now. Google me with any of these podcasts. Google me with you. Google me with um, Ivor. Google me on uh, Low Carb MD. I mean, you can just – I'm on a bunch of stuff now. And uh, you can find out stuff. You can even get my phone number if you want. But if you start harassing me, I'll send somebody after you. You know, I'm Italian from New York, so got to watch <laughs> out. So, uh, <laughs> so anyway, no – you know, I would love, you know, some of the contacts you have, this Dr. Steele, if you mm-hmm. talk to McGuff, I, I really have spoken to him. I, I just, in fact, I got an email from Ellington two days ago, and I said, you know, well, you, uh, me, McGuff, maybe Kenny Hutchinson, or whatever, maybe a couple of guys, I think we should get on some kind of a podcast together for a couple hours and just do a, like, oh, that'd be amazing. Let, and, let me host know, it. I think, <laughs> listen, I... I I would, I'm serious. I'm available. I would love to do it because, you know, I, if, if somebody doesn't agree with me, I don't feel rejected or neglected. That's, 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 they don't agree. That's fine. I, I have no problem with that. That's, that's ben, cool. I t- somebody I tell you, knows some I, stuff. And- I'll tell you what, uh, the listeners heard you say that, and I guarantee you 99.9% of them thought, I would absolutely love that in terms of listening to a roundtable discussion with you, Ken Hutchins, Ellington Dard, and Dr. Yeah. Dard McGuff. That's the dream. Um, you know, and uh, back to what you're saying about introducing you to some of the people I mentioned on this, you know, uh, if you, it, you know, it can go both ways. You know, I've, I, I know the listeners would love to have Ellington Dard on the show. Um, unfortunately, you know, it's been difficult to try and get Ellington and uh, Ken on the show, but I'd love to at some point if they were uh, interested, for sure. Love to hear what they have to say. Yeah, I am. And I, even even McGuff and myself, I would love to do it because, you know, uh, like I said, we don't agree with certain applications, but on the science, I have total respect and appreciation for this guy. I think he's great, and I like the way he talks. Uh, I, I like what most of the stuff he says. Like I said, I would like to, you know, and, and this may be more of an intellectual debate than anything, but that's just kind of, it, it would be interesting to me. I, I would love to do it. Yeah, cool. Okay, well, um, let's see if we can... Uh... Perhaps figure that one out over email and uh, watch this space, I suppose. Um, And for everyone listening, to find the blog post for this episode, please go to corporatewarrior.co forward slash Dr. Ben 2. That's number two. uh, And Dr. Ben will take you to our first episode. And for all episodes, please go to corporatewarrior.co forward slash podcast. And until next time, thank you very much for listening. Discover how to improve health, become a great personal trainer, and build a successful high-intensity strength training business. Check out CorporateWarrior.co. CorporateWarrior.co. This episode is brought to you by ARX, the most innovative, efficient, and effective all-in-one exercise machines I have ever seen. I was really impressed with my ARX workout. The intensity and adaptive resistance was unlike anything I've ever experienced. I love how the machine enables you to increase the negative load to fatigue target muscles more quickly. And I love how the workouts are effortlessly quantified. The software tracks maximum force output, rate of work, total amount of work done and more in front of you on screen, allowing you to compete with your previous performance to give you and your clients real-time motivation. The ARX uses a computer-controlled motor to give you the exact amount of resistance your clients need 100% of the time. This means that the resistance can never become dangerous, is intuitive and simple to use, and can provide you with all of the results you and your clients are looking for in a fraction of the time. ARX is highly effective and efficient in delivering all of the benefits of exercise, including increased strength, 
muscle mass, cardiovascular conditioning, bone mineral density, and injury recovery. As well as being utilized by many high-intensity trainers to deliver highly effective and efficient workouts to their clients, ARX comes highly recommended by world-class trainers and brands, including Bulletproof, Tony Robbins, and Ben Greenfield Fitness. To find out more about ARX and get $500 off install when you place an order, please go to arxfit.com and mention Corporate Warrior and How Did You Hear About Us field. So again, to get $500 off install when you order, head on over to arxfit.com and enter Corporate Warrior and How Did You Hear About Us field. <laughs> 